2020-2021. We all know how rough that first year was. You know, I'm not really a newcomer to YouTube. If you've subscribed recently or have only seen my current stuff, I have at least half a decade of videos over on my Vimeo. They were different years of my life, and I wanted to move on and learn from them. But you still need to make sure that those things are still there for people to see, so I moved them over. 2020 was going to be the year I finally came back. Show that experience off. But I was laid off from my job. And I had to move back in with my parents for a bit. That was a little over a year <laughs> of uh, stress and uncertainty and filling up endless free time with every single hobby that I have, except for making videos. I needed a new camera, I needed new editing software, and the internet connection at my parents' house is just not great, so it was the one thing I couldn't do. So in 2021 rolls around, set out to do it, and so far it's been a fun ride. It's been exactly as stressful <laughs> and rewarding and unrewarding as I was hoping it would be. And besides, since it was the only hobby I couldn't indulge in, it was the only hobby that I have that I wasn't completely sick of. Art helps us, and art heals us. So after everything that happened in 2020 and 2021, the only things I really actually want to look back on is the art. We're gonna go in this order. Movies, video games, books, internet stuff, and then TV shows. Sound good? Now, if you only want something very specific, hey, check out the description because I'll be putting time codes for all those things. And yeah, you can also scroll the mouse thingy over the bar there. That works, especially if you're using a TV since you won't get a description. Will it be a bit clunkier? Yeah, but you chose the TV way, so unfortunately that's all you get? So even as I'm recording this, it's already 2022. But it still feels right to start this section off with the movie that's related to New Year's Eve. Tokyo Godfathers was basically a blind buy because of a sale. Although I had heard of it before. Not much of anything, it's just that I'd seen it on greatest animated films of all time lists, and I'd heard the name Satoshi Kon. So I figured it would be good. Uh, didn't realize it would be this good. I love realism, and I love non standard protagonists. Let me see people with flaws. Let me see people try to overcome those flaws and let them have attitude problems. Tokyo Godfathers is this shockingly brilliant film where the whole story is coincidence after coincidence. And the bizarre thing is just how believable it gets after a while. It sells you that concept and you believe it the entire time. <laughs> it's gotten me excited to see the rest of Satoshi Kon's filmography. I'd never seen the film until 2021, and the second time I saw the film was also 2021. <laughs> I don't really tend to rewatch films twice within one year. So if there's anything I can say to the film other than that, can't think of it. <laughs> there's just something really workably good about this film. <laughs> Alright, since we started with an animated movie, well, let's just go on to another one, why don't we? Hey, 
A filmography I am a lot more familiar with is the works of Ralph Bashke. And I've come pretty close to watching his entire filmography by this point. And what I got to during 2020 was Hey Good Looking. Hey Good Looking was definitely one that was always going to be an interesting one to cross off because the only things I'd ever actually heard about it was Ralph's opinion on the movie. That being, while he felt ultimately the film was still good, he could not get over the fact that the live action segments were cut. He was more upset about how the studio treated the movie than the movie itself. As for seeing it myself though, while I don't know what those live action segments would have added, I don't miss them. I really actually enjoyed the movie for what it was. Now if you're slightly familiar with Bashki's filmography, you might be expecting a hard-cutting social commentary piece, something that, while a bit wacky sometimes and while a bit juvenile sometimes, could be pretty hard-hitting and gritty and gross and bloody. And Hey Good Looking kind of feels like a diet version of all that. There's not as much social commentary, there's less blood, and I feel there's less swearing and nudity. The animation is stretchier and bouncier, closer to the stuff he would do for TV, but it all kind of comes together for a film that was pretty fun to watch. I don't tend to see this movie criticized by Ralph Bashke fans. I don't see too many of them praise it as one of his best. But I can kind of see this one becoming a top five for me. I really enjoyed this. It is just different enough from the other social commentary films to feel like its own thing, while still having plenty of the things I like from Ralph Bashke movies so it doesn't feel too far away from his type of film. Universal Pictures is proud to present the motion picture directing debut of one of America's most talented and respected artists. Cut! Cut, 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 cut! So while I've been a longtime fan of the Tales from the Crypt TV series, the movies were a bit of a blind spot for me. One time on Netflix years ago, I did happen to watch Ritual, of all things. But if you ask me to describe that one, uh, I'll be sitting in silence for about 10 minutes as I try to recall anything. But hey, 2020 rolled around with all the free time in the world. So I watched all of them. Uh, even those two films that have nothing to do with the show and are entirely from the pages of the magazines. <laughs> so how were they all? Well, those first two films, Tales from the Crypt and Vault of Horror, uh, the first one's pretty good and the second one's really good. Then there's Bardello of Blood, which is based on the show. And that one's cheesy and bloody and campy, like a lot of good episodes. It kind of just does feel like a longer episode. But, you know, when the show was this high quality, I don't really care. <laughs> I still had some fun with that one. But the one that sticks to everybody, and the one that did stick to me out of all of them, was of course, Tales from the Crypt Presents Demon Knight. So what does Demon Knight have to offer that all those other movies didn't? It pretty much has the tightest script and the best world building. There's something believable about this one that I think even the other films did not get to. It feels like what one of the best episodes of the show would have been, except with, you know, a movie's timeline and a movie's budget. There's also some really great performances from this cast with the standout performance being Billy Zane. You fucking hold dunk, hold dunk, well then there, motherfuckers! It's completely nuts and completely crowd-pleasing, but it's still also just very well made and very easy to understand. It walks this nice balance. And sure, as a film of the TV show, obviously the fans are the ones I have to recommend this the most to, but I think this one's well made enough you can jump in without knowing anything. That's one of the great things about an anthology series. Every episode was meant to stand alone by itself. And this movie really, really understands that too. I'm not gonna hurt you. 
alive. It stars Billy Zane from Dead Calm, William Sadler from Die Hard 2, and Jada Pinkett from Menace to Society. Ooh, I love those titles. The demons are here! And ladies, if you think Demon Knight is too gross and yucky... Wow! Thank you! <laughs> Many of you are likely familiar with the Dollars Trilogy, Serge Leone's masterful films for a fistful of dollars for a few dollars more, and the good, the bad, and the dollars. They're a thematic trilogy. The story isn't concurrent or right after each other, and in fact it might not even be the same main character, more so the idea of him. It may have always been Clint Eastwood, but it was just a man without a name walks into town. There is a second thematic trilogy from Leone, and from what I've seen so far, it might not be just as good as the Dollar Trilogy, it is likely way better. <laughs> I've seen two out of the three. The one I haven't seen yet is Once Upon a Time in America, and trust me, it's one I really do plan on getting to very soon. And the one I'd seen before was Once Upon a Time in the West which is one of my favorite movies, so there was a reason I really wanted to get to the one I'm about to talk about. And it's the one that is kind of the most obscure, which is very sad, but it also makes sense considering they didn't really seem to settle on a name. When it gets compared to the other two, it is sometimes called Once Upon a Time in the Revolution, although admittedly I've only seen that on paper, I've never seen the film actually called that. Now, one title I do see it called quite a bit, both on the free with ads version on YouTube and through Kino Lorber's Blu-ray releases is A Fistful of Dynamite. And I'll be real, not a big fan of that name either. It makes it sound like it's just a parody of For A Fistful of Dollars. And while the movie is a comedy in the first half, I wouldn't really call it a parody. For these reasons, and just the fact I like this title the best, I prefer to call it the original American name. Duck, you sucker. The funniest thing about me talking about Duck, you sucker is that if you go into my letterbox account right now, you'll see it's at three and a half stars. But just like Once Upon a Time in the West, the first time I saw the movie, I just wasn't prepared for what it was really. It's remained in the back of my mind since that first viewing and I've only grown fonder of it the more and more I think of it. This film has the potential, for when I rewatch it, to jump all the way up to a perfect five. I love the genuinely genius mix of tone that this movie has. That first half is a comedy, like I've already described. A very bleak and very dark comedy. It's wicked funny. And then the second half of the movie happens. And there's a part you can pinpoint, basically, you suddenly feel it. You suddenly feel, hey, this movie's not funny anymore. I don't even know how to describe it to you, and I think the marketing didn't either. You may have been noticing while watching this trailer, you're seeing stuff like the motorcycle, the witty banter. The trailers didn't want you to know this was a comedy movie until the halfway point. <laughs> It just wants you to think it was a comedy. But this sadly mostly forgotten film might actually be Sergio Leone's best. And considering Once Upon a Time in the West is one of my all-time favorite films, you know I'm not just saying this. But speaking of all-time best output, one more thing I gotta mention. It's no coincidence I watched this film in 2020, the year that we lost Ennio Morricone. If you want the most hard, concrete proof that this man was a total legend of a composer, there's this one theme that goes throughout the movie. It is mostly for the main character, John. It happens during the atmospheric bits, it happens during comedy bits, and it happens during drama bits. And not only is the melody itself just some of the best <laughs> I've ever heard in a film, but the lyrics are genius. Because there's only one. Shum, 
This is the work of one of the greatest. You guys want something a bit lighthearted after uh, the bleakness of a spaghetti western? I think I might just have one of the most heartwarming things ever made. The Andy Griffith Show. No, 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 no. I'm not skipping the TV section. I just wanted the excuse to play the theme song. I love The Andy Griffith Show. It is one of my uh, all-time favorites. Maybe not top 10, but my very long list of TV shows. Trust me, it's on there. And I bought the season one Blu-ray in the beginning of 2020. But because you can watch the show anywhere, even local TV airs it, I thought it would be interesting to just look through the special features on the Blu-ray. I'm glad I did. I found the backdoor pilot. I found some behind the scenes stuff. I found the original ad reads, which is such a great thing to have. And I found the made for TV reunion movie. So to go back to Demon Knight for a second, what makes that movie really great is that it's a theatrical movie that knows it needs to stand on its own. And what made it return to Mayberry so good was that it's a made-for-TV movie, so it doesn't need to have that excuse. <laughs> Return to Mayberry is something I'm only recommending to big Andy Griffith Show fans who have probably not heard of it or just haven't seen it yet. Because it's really, really good. <laughs> it came out in the 80s, which is also why it's in color, as you'll see, and why everyone is notably older. But it doesn't skip a beat. It's just fan service. You're seeing these characters again that you already love. Gomer and Goober get to be on screen. Barney gets to reconcile with Thelma Lou. There's a fake sea monster. I've never seen anything more Andy Griffith. Yeah, so I can't talk on this one very long. It's just, did you like the Andy Griffith show? Do you want more of the Andy Griffith show? Here's more of the Andy Griffith show. And it's really good. <laughs> it doesn't skip a beat for exactly what you wanted it to. Okay, I think we have enough time here to talk about this documentary, since we're basically on a made-for-TV movie tangent, if you want to call it that. Oh, bear in mind saying this. If you think there's going to be more TV show movies, I will save those later for the TV section. But anyway, yeah, let's talk about The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, which is a documentary about The Wizard of Oz, the original MGM movie. Now, it does fluff the film like they always do, but considering it's the Wizard of Oz, it's kind of hard to disagree when they brag it's one of the most popular movies ever made. <laughs> Normally, you can point a finger and say, hold on, this is marketing. But in this case, you point your finger and say, hey, that's a correct fact. <laughs> and even then, they weren't afraid to say some of the problems that the movie had behind the scenes. Did you know that the makeup effects almost killed two completely different actors? <laughs> I found that out through this. <laughs> and they even mentioned how this film's original popularity was short-lived because it got beaten at the box office by a wide margin by Gone with the Wind. It's pretty short, I believe it's just under an hour long, and the whole thing's narrated by Angela Lansbury. So hey, for once, a concept as simple as Angela Lansbury talking about the Wizard of Oz actually pulls off pretty well. I used to watch a lot of these kind of things and I'd always usually like them. This is one of the better ones I've seen in a long while. There's a reason there's multiple ways to watch it. I bought it on DVD by itself, not knowing it's included as a special feature on the 4K version of the movie. So yeah, I'd just say watch it on the 4K Blu-ray for the movie. Still, I recommend it either way. I mentioned earlier that I had to move back in with my parents for a while there. But thankfully, I like my parents, so we actually got some bonding uh, time. <laughs> One thing I specifically did with my father was that we would watch some movies on his Amazon Prime account. And of all the ones we watched, the one that will stick with me the most is the recent BBC version of An Inspector Calls. It's just a pretty simple, straightforward mystery, and one of those mysteries where it's a snowball effect. You keep finding out worse and worse things about these people. 
But if you're not familiar with the story, and I wasn't when I first came in, in fact until I just did the research now, I didn't even realize this is an older story. But the way an inspector calls works is an inspector shows up to this family to tell them the news of this sad crime, and as he goes on and shows that he knows a lot more about these people than they think, it again snowballs into revealing just how horrible and selfish these people are. To the point where even the family is disgusted by each other and by themselves after a while. It's one of those kind of fun mysteries where there's more to unwrap than just the main mystery. And I've always been a big fan of those. It's only on Amazon Prime here in the US from what I understand. It looks like the UK got a DVD, but that's as much as they got, other than I'm assuming streaming still. And it's sad because I would easily buy a Blu-ray even if I had to do it imports. Not just because the movie is really, really good, but again, it was the best movie I saw with my dad that year. That's, that's worth remembering, I think. Speaking of Amazon Prime, here's something I watched by myself. You guys know what it's time for? It's time for Riff Tracks! Riff Tracks! The amount of Riff Tracks on Prime is almost overwhelming. I've always been a fan of the Christmas short extravaganza, but I was never able to find another Riff Tracks installment that really stuck out to me. And with so many options in front of me, I was determined to find one. And I did. The Riff Tracks gang is back for the Summer Shorts Beach Party live. Summer Shorts Beach Party has a really great selection of strange shorts, and it has an even better selection of guest stars. Mary Jo comes back. Frank and Trace come back. Mr. Peanut Butter shows up. Everyone mixes together very well in their own little segments, and they especially all gel together very well for the very last one. It's kind of set the standard for me now in what I know I should look for. I've kind of realized, look for when they tackle shorts, and look for when they do it live. For whatever reason, that is my favorite combination. By the way, Riff Tracks is this thing where a bunch of comedians get together and make fun of this really weird thing that they're all watching. Uh, it's, it's made by some of the people that worked on Mystery Science Theater in the later years, so should have explained that, because I'm sure some of you have gone this whole section going, what the hell is a Riff Tracks? Who says steroids made Barry Bonds' head bigger? <laughs> <laughs> and where? Well... You know how a conscience works. Nope, I'm a sociopath. It's just about time to get... Friendly eyes begin to shine under the magic spell. Oh, I get it now. This film is about the invention of amphetamines. <laughs> yes. Hey, speaking of shorts, I've got a special one for you. Now I'm going to tell you a very old story. It's called... Teeny Tiny and the Witch Woman. Uh, just before 2020 actually started, so the end of 2019 for those of you bad at calendars, I found a bunch of these Scholastic DVDs, specifically Scholastic Video Collection and Scholastic Storybook Treasures. What's cool about these is that these are all long out of print, Although sometimes I find them online for not too bad, so perhaps they're stuck in a warehouse somewhere. But they're collections of short, animated stories based off of kids' books, and they're all really fun little time capsules. Like the one specifically I'm going to talk about, a lot were animated by Gene Deitch. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but if the name sounds a little bit familiar, he was a Tom and Jerry animator, so that may be where he sounds familiar from. He certainly was to me. I had some great fun with the ones that I watched, and there was one specifically that, uh... I swear I'm not making this up. This one haunted my soul. Running after them. Ooh, you took my magic soul! The animation in this alone is really tremblingly frightening. And that's before you get to what the witch sounds like. I 
have no clue how they captured this voice as perfectly as they did. It's so perfect for this little horror short. And seeing this whole thing for myself, I'm calling this a horror short. Never take children's horror for granted. Teeny Tiny and the Witch Woman. It was the best short I saw out of all of these, and one that will never leave me. I see a light, he called. We have time for one more film. And still, I have to say some backstory to it first. So at the end of 2020, I decided to do something I'd want to do for a while. Thanks to Letterboxd, I was able to actually put the work in to get it done. I went through, rewatched. some of these were first time watches, but a lot were rewatches. the Rankin Bass catalog. While I did not get to every single thing, I came probably about as close as you could with only a month. I even ranked them all, from best to worst, and I really did go out there. It wasn't just the stuff they personally created in-house, it was when companies took their IP for later, like say the Miser Brothers Christmas. It was stuff that was kind of loosely related, like how for some weird reason Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol is always put in these DVD sets with purely Rankin Bass stuff. Can someone explain to me why this keeps happening? And yeah, to go back to the main catalog for Rankin Bass, I didn't just look at their holiday stuff. Which is good, because the one I want to talk about is their most popular film. Most likely, even if you do count Rudolph. Where have you been? Where have you been? And where were you 20 years ago? 10 years ago? Where were you when I was new? When I was one of those innocent young maidens you always come to. I mentioned in my first Disney ranking video that while I'm a huge animation fan, there's a lot of classic animated films I still haven't got around to. And until the end of 2020, The Last Unicorn was on that list. I prefer characters over story lore, so fantasy's a hard sell for me. And that's one of the reasons I can tell you why I found The Last Unicorn to be so good. World building and the mythology are important, but when they're brought up the most, it's usually to explain something character related. For example, the backstory of the villain. It's the characters that sell this movie more than anything else. I don't know many fantasy films, and especially many kids' fantasy films, that have characters like the ones here in The Last Unicorn. Outside of the Christmas stuff, this is why Rankin Bass is remembered. I went through their whole catalog, and <laughs> if Rankin Bass just becomes the company that's known for Rudolph and The Last Unicorn, while it's a little sad that there'll be some features lost in that remembrance, at least people will be remembering The Last Unicorn, as it really is something else in terms of fantasy films. Now that I'm a woman, everything is strange. Video games are gonna be the longest section, uh, looking at the script here. And there is one really good reason for that, and I'm gonna get through that real quickly right now. Up until the very end of this video, the video game section is gonna have one thing that none of the other sections will have. See, when it comes to the movies, and the YouTube videos, and the books, and all that, they were all things I watched or read for the very first time in 2020 or 2021. But video games are, well, conveniently, this time they're different. Rewatches and rereads and replays are where you can realize a lot of things you just did not notice the first time or could not notice the first time. And when we get to the very last section, again, there'll be one thing where there will be some rewatch. Other than that, though, Replays are pretty much exclusive to the video game section because of just how many times that merited discussion. 
So with that out of the way, how many games even qualify? I'm sure you've been getting some videos from me recommended in the sidebar, so you'll notice I review a lot of edutainment games, and I also review some uh, movies from the Criterion Collection, which is why there were no Criterion films in this video. I feel like I kind of covered it for Criterion movies that I watched this year. And for the most part, that would be what I want to talk about with the games too. Our entertainment games I played as a kid and then replayed in 2021 for a funny internet video worth devoting into this as well? I feel no. But there is one game I replayed that probably won't be in the sidebar because I set it to premiere, assuming that would make it do well, not knowing that. It just means it doesn't get put into the algorithm afterwards, only during the premiere. But there's another reason, which is just that, well, it's the same reason why I reviewed it in the first place. It's a game I really love, and I really want to talk more about it. The funny thing about going back to DDLC when Plus came out was, well, while it did become one of my favorite games all the way back in 2017, there was a bit of a worry going into this replay. I knew I'd still love it, but when the game is about deceiving you with a facade, can that work a second time nearly as well? The game is all about its midway twist, and that is perfect, but is it perfect as a game or perfect as a memory? It was one of my favorite games before the replay, and after the replay, it actually went up a few spaces. <laughs> By going for the golden route, I ended up seeing the other sides to the rest of the characters. Stuff I didn't know I missed so much on that first playthrough. Full disclosure, I did not like Yuri the first time I played. <laughs> I thought she was pretentious, an art snob full of herself, and so spending time with her sounded stupid. But because I did now, I love her just as much as the others. There was a lot more character to her besides what happens in the twist. And I appreciate it so much now. Way more on a level than I did the first time. I don't have a favorite Doki. <laughs> I've gotten so connected to the four of them that I can't pick. And that's the thing too. I loved the game even before the twist. There were some hints in the game that there was some real character writing here. And there was even real gameplay. I love visual novels, but I also hate so many of the things they do. I hate choices that only show up at the very end. I hate the use of cliches and stereotypes instead of real characters. I hate that you really are just reading the game more often than anything in so many of them. I first discovered DDLC from a Let's Play, and when I saw the poem game before my eyes, I was so excited. A good looking visual novel with gameplay. I said, screw the Let's Play, I'm playing this one for myself. It was instant love in 2017, and in 2020? I didn't just review that game as an excuse to play it again. The review happened because I wasn't really able to convince myself to play anything else that month. I had to play this game again front to back. I had to fully rediscover this game. I thought I loved, and who knew? I loved it more. Uh, real quick, in the beginning of 2021, I did write about every single video game I played front to back that year. And I'm still going to do that for the beginning of 2022 as well. So hey, all the games that weren't super great enough to get in this video, you'll be able to go read there. So you'll be able to read me complaining or just saying the game was pretty fun but not excellent. Take a look if you want. I guess I'll link the blog. Why not? Anyway, let's get to the next uh, excellent game that I replayed. <laughs> uh, you ready for some Batman? So I was late to the game with Arkham Knight, even the first time I played it. I'd heard the discourse, and I knew it was about the PC version. So I sat down, 
someone who'd already played Asylum and City, because I wanted to finish the Arkham story with Knight. Fucking hated that game. Why did I need the Batmobile every two fucking feet? Scarecrow is not a compelling major villain, and he doesn't even act like the same character from the previous games. You saw Barbara get killed by the villain, known for his hallucinations on greatest fears. Her kidnapping doesn't really make sense when you think about it. Bruce, why did you be this dumb, Bruce? How on earth did you not think for a second, Bruce? So why'd I give it another shot if I was this viscerally upset about it? Well... A couple things you may have noticed in what I just said there. I played Asylum and City. It wasn't until 2020 I played Origins and Blackgate. And no, those aren't the games I'll be talking about right now. Now don't get me wrong, I enjoyed Origins quite a bit. I haven't played Asylum in a while, but I think I like it better. Blackgate's an interesting uh, can of worms though. It's a pain in the ass the first time you play it, but it's designed for subsequent playthroughs and they give you this costume that grants you invincibility. It became the only Batman Arkham game I earned the Platinum Trophy for, so I can't be that mad. <laughs> I also watched uh, the Assault on Arkham movie around that time. I've done everything but play the VR game <laughs> now. And because I finally rounded off the other stuff, and with all that out of the way, I felt the urge to go back to Asylum and City. So I bought the remastered versions for the Xbox One, and the best deal at that time I did was a bundle that included the full version of Night. Notice I said trophies earlier, I played it on PS4, and that PS4 version I bought didn't have all the DLCs. It had the Harley one, and it had the Scarecrow Batmobile DLC things that were completely exclusive to PlayStation. But that means I didn't try the other DLCs. And you know, one of the DLCs lets you fight the Mad Hatter, who's my favorite Batman villain. And then I realized that that DLC requires you to actually play the base game again. I thought it was just a side thing like the other DLCs. But hey, I figured if I at least play Night again, I can then just jump back into Asylum and City and be done with it. Let's pull the Band-Aid off so I can fight the Mad Hatter. Here's the thing about that. Uh, I did fight the Mad Hatter, don't get me wrong. By replaying the game, this time I was more prepared for the quality drops in the writing. Don't get me wrong, the script for Arkham Knight still has some really bad quality drops. I'm gonna straight up say, while the story for Blackgate is not the most exciting one, it's still consistent, so I still can't even call it the weakest script. <laughs> Knight is still the weakest script, I'm not joking with that. But that was such a shock. I never noticed that there are some good bits in that story. And there's still the little touches that I really appreciated. Uh, I forgot how much I really loved Professor Pig. The Man Bat stuff was better than I remembered. And I liked the Two-Face bank jobs. I felt they actually did a better job showing the tragedy of his character than the last few games did. And then, because I had also played Origins before this replay, I noticed how many times they reference Origins. If you have not played Origins, it's more necessary than you think. Both Firefly and Deathstroke kind of turn up out of nowhere, as if you're supposed to already know who they are in this universe. They were introduced in Origins. That's why they didn't get a big explanation, just like the Penguin, just like the Riddler, just like Hush. I did meet them already. And speaking of Firefly, that chase that ends his missions is fun! That Batmobile controls a lot better the second time. The DLC works pretty well. It feels like Hatter, Croc, Freeze, and Raish were always there. And it feels like the finale. Everyone is here again and there's send-off in some way. And can we talk about how good the fighting is? This was the best Arkham combat in the whole series. Muscle memory kicked in pretty well. I remember a string of like five to six encounters in a row. I just wasn't hit. I'm terrible at these games and I was getting untouched. This was so well refined. The Riddler stuff is fun. <laughs> you wanna know how much fun I had? Look at this screenshot. That's a hundred percent. Every mission. Every bad guy. And you know what that includes? 
You know that guy, the cop who's green because he's a, a Riddler uh, inside man? Did you know you can arrest him? You're supposed to walk up to him and hit the counter button to interrogate him. I did not know that. When I looked everybody else up and it said there was one guy missing, I read it, I found that out, I was so excited that that little detail is there. And because that guy was last, that guy was the final boss. How do you hate a game where that's the final boss? There's a lot of YouTubers way bigger than me, and they talk about how they wish they could play a game again for the first time. But Arkham Knight, if you'd asked me before 2021 about Arkham Knight, I would have told you straight up it's the worst Arkham game and it's miserable. Playing it again? It's still got the worst story, but it's well refined in so many other ways that I really like it. <laughs> I don't know how, but I really like Arkham Knight. <laughs> and it just took me playing it all over again. And now we got one last game where my opinion almost radically changed. I did like it the first time, but I wanted to love it. The controls were clunky and hard to figure out. Ridiculously obtuse. Because you're supposed to sit down and completely absorb it into you. The game is made to play a second time, despite how long it is. Do you have my bag? Always, Dutch. <laughs> Okay, so like I said, the blog will cover every game I did front to back, including ones that won't be here. But I also feel it's not fair to just skip over the rest of the games I replayed that I can still kind of associate with these two years. So let's do a rapid fire montage. I replayed Brothers A Tale of Two Sons, a two player game where, well, turns out it's actually one player controlling both characters. It's ridiculously high art, <laughs> and I loved playing it again. The controls were a lot better. I think I died like only three times, which is amazing for controls. Uh, pretty hard to figure out your first time. <laughs> Red Dead Redemption 2 all over again, I guess. So here's something that's a replay, but in a weird way, a first-time experience, because it's a remaster. Uh, I love Saints Row the Third, and that remaster they put out, ugh. How does it look this good? How does decently realistic looking graphics work for an unrealistically goofy ass game? <laughs> I just, it, oh man, I started Saints Row with the third and I don't regret it, man. I really like Hitman Absolution. I'm sorry. I know a lot of diehard Hitman fans are like, it's too actiony. Just because it's a little different than the others does not inherently make it bad. That being said, I had a little bit more issues this time. I don't think it's because this was also the remake because I don't know if they even remastered it. It looks pretty much the same. But I will say, I played a higher difficulty this time, and whew, if you can't action your way out of something, the game feels like it doesn't understand what to do, which is weird for a game that's supposed to be very stealthy. That I will agree with. I still like the game. And you know what? I guess we're just gonna go through a triple for Black Sheep. I love Fallout 4. I am done pretending that I don't love Fallout 4. I've never pretended that I didn't love it. I've always admitted that I love Fallout 4. I don't care, though. Yes, the crafting is just there because it was chasing a trend. It's still a good mechanic, though, so I don't care. Yes, the emphasis on the shooting makes it more like a first-person shooter than an RPG, but it's fun so I don't care. Is the story writing weaker than 3 and New Vegas? I will admit to that, but I still like the characters quite a bit, and if I can still have a lot of fun with characters I really like, I don't think that's a terrible sacrifice. I also played a lot of Halo in 2021, but believe it or not, this is the first half of the story. We'll get back to it later. But to make this part short, I went for every single collectible, and I got all of them except for Datapad 10 in Reach. I don't think I'm ever gonna get that one. Don't know how I didn't mention this earlier, I bought a GameCube in the very beginning of 2021. <laughs> and would you believe that the GameCube game that I replayed, I owned a PlayStation 2 back in the day, so technically it's a replay, sort of is, sort of isn't, but the one I replayed was Shrek Super Slab. 
And yes, it's on this list, unironically, that game's really fun. I don't joke around with licensed games. And then we got one that I played at the very end of 2020. And this game did not get the attention that it deserves. Digimon came back hard between 2015 and 2016, with Cyber Sleuth being one of its best showings... ever. <laughs> then the side game Midquill came out, Hacker's Memory. I think it did pretty well in Japan, but I think it did pretty poor over here in the US. Because apparently people in the US just don't tend to buy these types of uh, mid-cool side game things. And that's a shame. The first game's great. The hacker's memory takes everything from it and improves it a lot. The edges are smoothed out. There are new mechanics in just the right places. While the story is shorter, it's way more compact and doesn't meander nearly as much. And the story is also very unique for not just Digimon, but JRPGs in general. You aren't a big JRPG hero this time. You are an unimportant side character, and you never stop feeling like that. You are not the blank slate character who's just a write-in for whatever the player wants. You're not that good-looking hero that catches everyone's attention. In many cases, you kind of suck, and you kind of rely on others a lot. <laughs> But it means you have a fleshed out personality. It means your friend group feels more like a friend group instead of just the other people who are going to save the world in this JRPG. Your story is not as important in the grand scope. It's just important to you and your little bubble. And that little bubble is so beautiful. The only flaw that this game has is that you need to play the first game. It kind of casually spoils it, so you can't even just, you know, hope you'll figure things out. Thankfully, the re-release on both the Switch and the PC has both games. And they even added some new stuff to the first game. Hacker's Memory is going to remain one of my favorite Digimon things ever, and... And it's probably one of the best JRPGs I have played in a lot of years. <laughs> And now, the rest of the games will be games I never played until 2020 and 2021. I guess there actually is a half exception, but I will call it out when we get there. When March 2020 was originally ending, and that horrible fate was suddenly closing in. Of all things, the game I started playing to ease my sanity was the game where you play as an evil alien named after a deadly virus from a game studio named Pandemic? At least the game was really good. They came from London, San Francisco, and every corner of the universe just to love one another. But some came... Peace, dude. ...to blow stuff up. Put this in your bong and smoke it! Like the first game, Destroy All Humans 2 is all about blowing shit up and having a ball doing it. The jokes land better in the first game, but there are some great bits from this sequel. What is a big improvement is just how much better that gunplay, and also all the other mechanics too. <laughs> the first game sure is funny, but it also sure is clunky. There's just moments where it isn't fun anymore, like the damn spaceship missions. When you get a two, none of that drags. Telekinesis works a lot better, cloaking worked better, the spaceship is actually really fun this time. For a game like this, that's kind of way more important, even than the funny bits. And one last thing, which is almost a tangent in some ways. There's not a music section, as you figured out earlier. I just don't listen to enough new songs to have a section dedicated to music. But when I'm completing games and getting all the collectibles and stuff, I'll tend to turn the game's sound off and listen to podcasts or live streams, and in some cases, I'll play some music, and I am not afraid to just uh, put some songs on loop and feel the emotional resonance of the music. With Destroy All Humans 2, my loop song was Telephone Line by Electric Lights Orchestra. 
And I don't know what it is, but going into the nightmare that was the beginning of 2020, while half aimlessly flying around, destroy all humans too, while listening to telephone line, it was a weirdly, serenely sad thing that I'm going to remember for quite a while. on Maneater. Everyone's fighting off more than they can chew. In a very similar vein to Destroy All Humans is Maneater, which funnily enough was the newest game to get on this list. Uh, you play as a bull shark whose stomach may as well be a black hole. She eats everything in this game, even if it's bigger than her. The story is fun and shockingly develops its villain way more than I thought it would. And especially for the setup of a fake, trashy reality TV show. The mechanics are also pretty sloppy, but on purpose. Not on the same level as, say, Octodad or Certain Simulator, but there's a reason those are the games I'm thinking of. And once you get a grip on the controls, though, it is really fun the way you can just flop this shark around and become this ball of violence. <laughs> I also played the DLC in 2021. And that's a lot more flawed. I found it pretty mediocre, and I think they rewrote the personality for the narrator, which is sad, as it, he is normally pretty funny in that base game. This game is also pretty dirt cheap for a newer game, so honestly, just jump into it. I think it's even on Switch by this point. Give it a shot! It's fun and bloody violence. <laughs> what more do you want in a video game? <laughs> well... I just mentioned some DLC, so let's get that thing where I said you could argue it's a half example of played for the first time, because I'm going to talk purely about a DLC. Pokemon Shield came out, and look, I liked the game. Is it my favorite Pokemon game? No. Is it one of my more liked Pokemon games? I guess not. But it's more enjoyable than some of the other ones I've played. I'd say it's rough metal, leading into a bit more fun as... Well, it may not be as impressive in open world as a lot of other open world games. It's fun for what it is. It was enough so that when the DLC was announced, I was interested. I've been playing Pokemon games for a very long time. I am interested to see how they tackle DLC. We no longer have to buy the same game again to get these experiences, just DLC. And if they pulled it off great the first time, that's a good sign. Uh, they pulled it off great the first time. <laughs> the Isle of Armor blew me away with how much I liked it. It's better than the main game. I didn't expect as much story content as we got. I didn't expect this to have some of the best characters in the entire game. And I'll even give a mention to some of the characters from Crown Tundra as well. I'm not going to talk about Crown Tundra because that DLC is very good too, but running around and chasing legendaries was never my favorite thing. So all I can really say about that is, as someone who doesn't enjoy that aspect as much, they streamlined it very well in Crown Tundra, to the point where I did really like it. Just not as much as the Isle of Armor. I enjoyed raising Cub Fu, which I did not think would matter. I really liked Avery as a rival, and I think his character development maybe works better than some of the other rivals in the main game, since a big criticism I had of the main game was when it decided to do more story-focused stuff. It copies uh, Sun and Moon's homework a little bit too hard. There's also way more content than I thought. Uh, once I beat the story, I figured that'd be it and I could just run around and find the diglet that are scattered around and stuff. Uh, and then more story stuff happened. <laughs> and not only that, that happened in Crown Tundra as well. But also, if you beat the main stories for both DLCs, there's another thing that unlocks after that. It's been a while since Pokemon has blown me away with how much endgame content there is. 
People complained about Sword and Shield not having much of an endgame, and that's not as new as some people may think. Pokemon is very hit or miss with endgame. Sometimes there's none, sometimes there's a lot. And Sword and Shield are now this weird nebulous entity of both. No DLCs, hardly any endgame. Either DLC, pretty good endgame. Both DLCs, you've been playing these endgames for longer than the main game. I haven't been this pleasantly surprised by DLCs in a while. <laughs> it's so much fun, and one of the better Pokemon experiences I've had for quite a while too. And this was from someone who was fine with Pokemon Shield. On the subject of Nintendo handheld games, I was always a handheld person with Nintendo. I mentioned I bought a GameCube earlier, but had a PS2 growing up. The only other console I ever had for Nintendo besides the Switch was the Wii, and I didn't even have it for that long. So because of that, yeah, didn't own a Wii U, even though I knew the Wii U was a thing. That means I skipped out on the original run for 3D World. I'm sorry, why did people find this game disappointing? I liked Odyssey better too, don't get me wrong. It's just, because I didn't play that many Mario games beforehand, I wasn't chomping at the bit for the big 3D exploration Mario instead of these boring 2D side-scrolling ones. So I just went in going, I hope this game's pretty good, and it turns out, oh yeah, it's a Mario game. They're all really good. <laughs> I love how this game feels, and I think the challenges come in just the exact right way. Nothing is ultra challenging before the final boss, and then the stuff after the final boss, uh, it's a good level of a bit too challenging. <laughs> also, the kitty power-ups are just a fun way to spice things up. <laughs> as well as all the different inherent abilities of the playable cast. I haven't even touched Bowser's Fury yet. And for a lot of people, that seems to be the thing they felt was worth their money, so... I'm excited! I got more of this game to play, and I already really loved it. <sighs> so in the movie section, I talked about an inspector calls, mostly because it was a bonding moment with my father, as well as the fact the movie was really good. So, I think it's fair to also talk about a bonding moment I had with my mother, now. You could argue I don't inherently need to do this. I have a one-word rebuttal. OBJECTION! When I was first in college, my mother and I would sometimes play video games when I was home. Thanks in part to some young adult stubbornness of being bored of board games, but also because my mother was vaguely interested in trying out specific niches in video games. Before you get too excited, it was stuff like the licensed Wheel of Fortune PlayStation 3 game, which is a really good game, but still. Sometimes it was clear she was just humoring me, but it worked out well enough that Come pandemic time, I was able to convince her to try out Ace Attorney. And it was very obviously the favorite game she's ever played with me. She unironically really got into solving these mysteries, and she loved all the characters in it. Maya and Pearl? Edgeworth? I didn't write this one in the script because this happened recently, but we just happened to be talking about it, and she remembered old bag of all characters. <laughs> Ace Attorney convinced her after all these years that spending two hours sitting down and playing a video game wasn't actually a waste of time. And sometimes it flew right by. And yeah, if you've played Ace Attorney, you know two hours can sometimes mean the whole case, and sometimes it means you're almost ready to maybe think about going into the first trial. Especially Rise from Ashes. That story is really, really good, but come on. So now we have the last one. And it's one I'd been meaning to get to for a couple of years now, and only just got to in 2021. Remember a bit ago, I mentioned Saints Row the Third, that I got into Saints Row with it, and I love it. I've also played 4, and I've also played God Out of Hell, which was in 2020, and wasn't good enough to get special featured in this. Not that it was bad, 
And I also love 4 quite a bit too. I'm just trying to let you guys know that I liked every game I'd played previously. And because of that, I heard a lot about what the fan favorite one was. And I needed to experience the fan favorite one for myself. <laughs> Okay, quick thing here. 2 is kind of considered so good that criticizing it can be rough for some people to hear. It is genuinely that sacred to them, and I get it. So please keep this in mind, that because of that, I'd like to get one big complaint out first. Especially because I need to know why this is a complaint. As weird as that sounds. I found the controls really clunky. Now, I played this through the backwards compatibility program for the Xbox One. So, maybe that's the reason. My Xbox One is also a base Xbox One. The one I bought specifically was in that sweet spot of where they stopped putting the Kinect in every single box, but before they dropped Kinect support. I never got a Kinect, but there is a port in the back of my Xbox for a Kinect. So yes, we're talking an older model here. Those could all be the reason. Could also be because the game's just pretty old. I'm willing to understand all these reasons, and big Saints Row 2 fans, please tell me if that's why. I, I want to know. It felt like something that was not necessarily inherently the game's fault. But it also meant some stuff was kind of unbearable sometimes. You know that fucking boat mission where you have to kill the boat full of Altor executives? That's a nightmare. Alright, so now that that's out of the way, we can talk about everything else. <laughs> Which is an absolute kind of masterpiece. Mr. Gat, you've been convicted of over 300 murders. Do you really expect this appeal to work? I figure with the statute of limitations, it really should be closer to 250. There's no statute of limitations for murder! Why the fuck not? Watch yourself, Mr. Gat. Or what? You hold me in contempt of court? You're already planning on giving me the chair. You think I'd give a shit about you not liking me? Fuck off. Sanctuary 2 is consistently praised for its amazing storytelling and its characters. How it balances between fun and a little silly, and then immediately darkly serious, and how it does it at the drop of a hat. The silly is not nearly as serious as Saints of the Third, but it still thoroughly works within the realms of Saints Row 2. Honestly, I just find it makes the games completely unique from each other. Which is something I appreciated more than ever playing Saints Row 2. Gat Out of Hell and 4 did also feel different from 3 and different from each other, despite how many similar elements were borrowed. And the whole Saints Row series from what I've played seems to be really good at that. Knowing that it still feel like Saints Row while deviating from that so every game is uniquely different. I'm even excited to play the first game and even the Agents of Mayhem spin-off just for those reasons. But back to Saints Row 2, these characters are just as lovable as I was hoping. The storytelling is fantastic, the comedy bits are really funny. Sometimes it's social commentary, sometimes it's just funny words, sometimes it's just really humorous character bit. It's all really good and it really captures kind of everything. The serious bits are emotional and they really resonate. Death hits hard. And sometimes it's your fault. Saints Row 2 is not afraid to remind you that your character is evil. And I see why they backed away from it in the later games. But again, it makes 2 more unique in hindsight. It hurt to watch some of the things I had to do, and it also hurt to see some of the things that happened to me because of it. The customization's great too. Now, I disagree with some of the fan base that thinks its customization is bigger than 3. I do think 3 has more options, but I think something clever about 2 is that it allows you to do some different things to kind of make up for the fact there's not necessarily that many items to buy. You can crook hats in a certain way, you can get spinning rims on wheels, you can put medallions on necklaces. And yeah, that stuff does not happen in the third game, and instead there's just a bigger amount of things. A marriage of the two would be fantastic, but something is probably only possible now with semi-modern hardware. <laughs> 
Saints Row 2 competed with GTA 4 when it came out. I had difficulties playing Saints Row 2 because of clunky controls, but I beat it. I played Grand Theft Auto 4, which has also some control issues by the by, and I didn't feel that game was worth finishing back then. And sure, I'm not gonna pretend that I don't prefer Saints Row the Third. I still do, and I always will. But just because I prefer one over the other, that doesn't mean the other is not excellent. Saints Row 2 is praised as the fan favorite, and I thoroughly, thoroughly see why. So throughout this video, I'm sure I've used both still images and video footage as my B-roll. And sorry to those who weren't fans of still images, as it's kind of hard to avoid using those for the book section. How's this? To at least give you something different to look at, we'll do comics first? Checking out my Goodreads for the past two years, I kind of read a lot of comics anyway? And yet, picking the right ones for discussion was pretty easy. I wanted something that really stuck with me, and something I feel I'd read enough of to discuss. This is comics, after all. To start, we'll go with something I've read almost all of, including its very recent ending. And hey, you still imitators will even get a quick bit of video considering the topic. Invader Zim's obscure popularity was never anything to sneeze at. The darkly funny Nickelodeon show that was aimed at teenagers had problems finding that right time slot. Which was especially bad news for its budget problems. And when I first found that out, I remember thinking to myself, since there's a demand for a return, why don't they play to Jonan's previous strengths and do a comic? Turns out, I have better ideas than I thought as said comic released in 2015 and kept going until 2021. While I like the show, I feel the comic did it better ever since the first full volume release. And since the series has now ended, again, it's worth noting that its final volume is also basically its best. <laughs> the setup is simple and very comic book. A more competent and evil Zim from another universe arrives, and Zim and Dib must work together to stop him. But the storytelling, and especially the story quirks, are very much Zim, and they make this feel truly unique. Zim's comic run has ended, and I think the legacy is well worth what we got. The end of Zim doesn't feel disappointing anymore. They ended on a high note, and this time they even lasted longer than the original episode count. Opinions may vary, but I really do think the comic reached heights the show didn't. And if you haven't given these comics a read yet, the volumes are pretty affordable, be it paperback or the digital versions, and they switch between purely episodic and self-contained stories, so picking up any of them is rarely daunting. Now, the Zim comics get pretty dark. I mean, hey, if you're talking about the place, they were allowed to say the H word. But nothing compares to Marvel's true hit for one of their underdogs. In 2021, I was able to finally track down the final two volumes for the magnum opus of THE comic book anti-hero. Ladies and gentlemen, and all those in between, this is the Punisher fucking Max. Garth Ennis' run added truly dark and disturbing tales for Frank Castle. Even some heartbreaking moments and blunt social commentary. And when he left, the readers felt it. Volume 5 was such a letdown in these collected volumes that I took a short break. Enough that the paperback volumes went out of print. But to be fair, this was just true for the paperback versions. The digital ones are actually still pretty easy to get. Of course, I didn't know that when I was looking for the rest of them, and also... It would look wrong to not have all seven on a shelf, and you know it. So I can still say, thank you indie comic shops, as one of the many in my city just happened to have the last two in stock when I looked in 2021. And reading those, 
Yeah. They eventually made up for Ennis' departure. In Volume 6, the stories were a bit better, with special mention to this one idea they had. Instead of following Frank, we followed the POV of some lower ranking criminals, as they were setting themselves down the path of becoming very soon to be Punisher victims. Flushing them out while making us not feel sorry for them either. A very difficult path for a POV, yet one I really liked. But when Jason Aaron took the wheel for the very end, holy shit. <laughs> Aaron may not have done the social commentary that Ennis loved adding, but every fucking thing else feels like the exact same quality. He perfectly created a Max version of the Kingpin, Pullseye, even the Hand shows up, and all of them feel just as compelling as the original Max villains like Barracuda and Nikki Cavello. It's the same orgy of violence with amazing storytelling we were missing after Ennis first left. And in some ways, it even manages to be kind of the best that Max ever got. This is how you end a series for a character. Plain and simple. Well, we did some comics. How about... Uh, manga is something I haven't read as much as I would like. And weirdly enough, I seem to only read the video game ones. Like, I've read some Pokemon Adventure stuff in 2020, but during that they also did some reprints for what they call the Collector's Editions, and they released 10 of them. And I was actually able to buy all 10 of them, but I haven't read all 10 of them, and I really feel like if I was ready to sit down and talk about what I like about Pokemon Adventures, I had to wait until I at least made it that far. Uh, outside of that, and the thing I am going to talk about, I finally bought the first volume for Elf and Lead. Some of you will think I'm heading in the right direction, but what about the manga I am going to talk about, and why I'm going to talk about it? And that's because I finished reading the original run for it, which is still overwhelmingly most of it. And currently, if I had to uh, say it, this is likely my favorite manga. And yeah, it is based on a video game. Three five eight over two days is an interesting part of the Kingdom Hearts franchise. Especially for me, because I never ended up playing the actual game. I've only experienced the story previously to the cutscenes that are in the compilations. Now. Like the other early games, it got adapted into a manga. And what makes the Kingdom Hearts manga unique is that it already knew its endpoints instead of needing to prepare for even more entries later, which, if you're not aware, has become a bit of a problem and a bit of contention in the Kingdom Hearts video game series. But yeah, it's understandable, they gotta keep future-proofing because this series is so popular, this stuff happens. But again, the manga didn't need to prepare that far ahead, so when it was able to end, he was able to kind of know how to get there a little bit better. And the manga's creator, Shiro Romano, was allowed a real shocking amount of creative freedom for that too. There's a lot of added jokes and a lot of added character quirks that make the manga a different version of the story. It's not one-to-one, -one, and it's really good that it isn't. Look, while Kingdom Hearts 1 and Kingdom Hearts 2 are games I love playing, the manga is just a better way to experience the pure story experience. The tragedy offered in Daisy's narrative is the same as in the manga. We just happen to also get added jokes that are genuinely funny and some more time with the other organization members than at least the cutscene version. Again, I can't contest to the game version. Despite being lighter on the surface, the tragedy sometimes comes across as even bleaker because we really see the innocents that are going to be hurt along the way. Now I said that this is the vast majority, that's because for some reason Shiro Amano came back to start a manga for Kingdom Hearts 3. I won't lie, I'm super interested in reading it, I'm just also super confused. Uh, every game is important to the narrative, so 
because the manga has skipped like almost half of the games and is now just adapting a game that really relied on all of those games' previous narratives. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen here, man. <laughs> the, night, the light novels don't have this problem because every game got a light novel. But what's going to happen with this manga? Are they going to just do a Kingdom Hearts 3 that only focuses on the story of the first four games? Is the manga just going to pretend those other games did happen and just awkwardly remind you that they happened? <laughs> I don't know, but I trust this manga enough that I am super interested to read it once all the volumes are out. If I'm going to give one criticism, the manga for Kingdom Hearts 1 starts out a little bit rough. It's pretty funny, but it definitely is a bit rough in knowing when to get serious. And then you get the, the second half of that, and especially the Chain of Memories, which are just out and out great. And two, and especially days, followed suit. Yeah, I can still recommend playing those early games, but if you care only about the story, I'm just gonna say it. Read the manga. <laughs> the manga might actually be the better version of the story, at least in some cases. And I know this is an opinion, and opinions vary, but I'm being dead serious when I say it. All right, move over, lame-ass comics. <laughs> We've got to move on to real books now. Uh, this section's going to be a bit weird. If you look at my Goodreads, you're going to notice some of the books I list here have a bit lower rating than a lot of the other recommendations. Even Duck You Sucker got a higher rating, and I had to try to justify that one. But like Duck You Sucker, it's a case of they may have only been three out of fives, but they stuck with me a lot more than that. Plus, Goodreads doesn't have half stars. So yeah, three can either be higher than I meant or lower than I meant, because there aren't half stars. I, I, I'm not saying it needs them. I'm just saying I would like the half stars. With that out of the way, though, let's just start with a higher rated one first. One I wouldn't have had to try to justify. <laughs> the I Hunt Killers franchise by Barry Liga is one I'm only vaguely familiar with. I found the finale of the trilogy in a bookstore one day, and despite seeing on the cover that it was in fact the end of a trilogy, it was called Blood of My Blood. That's too eye-catching to turn away. Liga turns out to be a type of writer who knows how to recap, so I was able to be caught up to speed and still thoroughly enjoyed the end of this story I wasn't aware existed. <laughs> so I knew about the first two books beforehand, but in 2020 I found out uh, there's a little collection of short stories based on this franchise as well. Uh, according to Laika himself, they're based off of fan questions he kept getting emails about, so he figured he'd answer them because so many people wanted to know. And I just gotta say, that's really cool. <laughs> Out of the ones I read, I'm gonna recommend Downtime, specifically because it isn't related to one of those fan questions, so you newcomers will be able to read it without having to worry about anything. It's vacation day for series main villain Billy Dent, and during said vacation, a murder he isn't responsible for happens, so he investigates to discover the real murderer. What makes this story so compelling is that there is no point during Billy's POV where he turns soft. Laga reminds you the entire time this is a truly evil yet charismatic villain. You are not supposed to sympathize with him. You are just here to watch him work. If you're a fan of characters like Alex Dularge or Patrick Bateman, this is a short story that is right up your alley. <laughs> so there's this place in Maine called Bar Harbor. It's this lovely little tourist trap, and like a lot of places, there are bookstores. <laughs> uh, one thing I've been buying when I go there is I like to find these allegedly true supernatural stories from Maine and sometimes just all of New England. Uh, if you couldn't tell by the way I phrased that, I'm not a true believer, but that's why I love reading these so much. When you find the right ones, it can be very interesting, and it can sometimes even shake your skepticism. And one I read in 2020 is called Cursed in New England. 
and while it's not one of my favorites, it's one of the better researched and formatted ones that I've read. The author starts out every single story with the story of the curse. Then after that, he breaks down more of the facts that he was able to find, and sometimes even discussing how this all came to be, how the story went along, how it's caught on over time, stuff like that. Stuff you would kind of expect more of these to do, but unfortunately a lot of these books are just written to kind of cynically get money out of people who are looking for <laughs> the biased takes they already have. <laughs> you know, the ones where they basically just drop a pretense and scream, but what if it did happen? And they don't need to. There are times you can give all the known facts and it does not erase the possibility of the truth of the supernatural if there is any. Still, maybe there's another reason for that. The ones I tend to like get a little bit more divisive online. I guess some people do just want to hear the grisly tales. And look, that's fine. But I think Kirsten New England has one of the better balances I've read recently. So out of all these little books, for the specific niche that they are, I'm going to say this is the one I can recommend. Uh, by far the biggest and longest books I read during all of this were in this compendium. Uh, two little compendiums that combined together have the first six Stephanie Plum novels. For those not already aware, Stephanie Plum by Janet Ivanovich is about said titular character, a 30s divorcee who takes up a new career, a bounty hunter. <laughs> While they are a romance novel series with a semi-love triangle thing going on, the series also has really great humor, really fun action, and a much bigger potty mouth than you might think. Ivanovich is hands down one of my favorite authors, and out of the five I had read, uh, I'd read the first one years ago but didn't have time to read the others until, uh, you know, the pandemic. <laughs> I don't know if I could pick a favorite. I guess I can pick a least favorite. Five and six were a little bit less good than the other ones, in my opinion. You know, four out of fives instead of fives out of fives. Uh, the series is so popular and makes so much money. Uh, it's in the 20s in terms of installments, and that is not counting the tons of spinoffs. And by going back to these early ones, I still really see why. <laughs> It's rare something can try to be a little bit of everything and be this fucking good. <laughs> Especially when they're romance novels. Look, I wrote one with a pen name. I have respect for the romance novels. That does not mean all of them are great. Stephanie Plum books are masterpieces at their best. And at their worst, they're near masterpieces. And not only that, most of the time, they're at their best anyway. Well, we got one left. Then I guess it's another compilation. Although this time, I can pick a specific one to recommend above the others. And also like the Stephanie Plums, I read the first one years ago. Maybe it was even that same year, come to think of it. And then couldn't get around to the others until... Unlimited free time, I guess we'll call it. It's a Peter Benchley set, and inside it comes Jaws, The Girl of the Sea of Cortez, and The Beast. You're likely familiar with Jaws. It's that Jaws. The one the movie is loosely based on, and that Benchley helped pen the screenplay to. You may also know Benchley grew to hate bull stories, as people were so scared of sharks, they tried driving the animal to extinction. Both of the Beast and Cortez are openly spitting on Jaws. Beast mentions it by name and calls it trash, and Cortez has a section where the titular girl saves a shark from a near lethal attack caused by snotty teenage boys trying to kill it for no reason. Girl of the Sea of Cortez is often seen as Benchley's best work. And I agree, it's the one I recommend out of all three the absolute most. Now that said, that's also why I like that The Beast is the last one of the collection. I think it's better to have that there because, while I do really like Cortez, and as exciting as it is, 
it doesn't really have a cooldown in its ending, believe it or not. Which kind of means all of the beast works as a cooldown, believe it or not. <laughs> oh, I'm also going to say, since the topic's here, uh, Jaws the novel is divisive, but I like it too. I find what it does differently is pretty interesting, at least for my tastes. Although I do think some of the plot points just kind of end without conclusion, and that's pretty disappointing. <sighs> Look, skip Jaws if you want, but try and make sure you read The Girl of the Sea of Cortez at some point in your life. It really was the best of this box set, even if I do think The Beast is pretty good too. It's the one that's gonna be the one I go back to the most from this set. This collection is a great way to get into the late Benchley's writing. And having these three together reminds us who this man was. A man with a deep love of the ocean and everything in it. It takes a love like that to know its majesty. And now, for YouTube videos, I guess that's a half-truth, as I need to talk about some podcasts real quick. Yeah, YouTube is where I listen to my podcasts, leave me alone. When my job came back, I briefly worked alone for a night shift, and podcasts really helped the time go by. And there were two upstarts of 2021 that deserve a special thank you for that. Sayra Spark is a YouTuber who reviews animated movies, TV shows, and even some web stuff on his main channel. But in 2021, he teamed up with an old childhood friend to do his own podcast called Bear vs. Gorilla, BVG for shorthand. It's BVG! Alright folks, welcome back to BVG. And, uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun listening to this when it was still a thing. Just two old friends catching up and shooting the shit. Usually talking about a hypothetical situation of who would win in a fight. And even then, they could use that premise for a variety of other things. A favorite of mine is actually this several episodes long idea of the fast food tier lists. Just two restaurants butting heads, seeing which one wins. And yeah, as someone who... Actually, I don't really eat fast food all that much anymore at all, but I still kind of find that exciting. And I think everybody else who listened to this podcast would not let me live without mentioning a couple other episodes. The one where the focus was Gaston from Beauty and the Beast, and he got to take on basically the entire world. And we're jumping back into the realm of Gaston and all of his shenanigans and how he fights the powers of the world and occasionally wins and mostly loses. Our next round, we're halfway through this at the moment, folks. We've got Gaston versus Gaston. Uh, ultimately, I think they would probably just start kissing. Now, as I basically already mentioned briefly offhand there, it hasn't updated in a lot of months. And look, Podcasts sometimes just don't pan out due to life situations, or view counts, or whatever it is. I'm just saying this for anybody who might be interested and decide to go watch some episodes. I'm not going to sit here and say that Saber Spark owes me an explanation for why his podcast isn't uploading anymore. I don't care the reasons why. I'm just happy that it existed in the first place, really. If we never get a new installment, at least we've got the episodes that we have. The other podcast has also not updated in a while, but the YouTuber behind it has stated that it's just on a hiatus. So this one is a bit easier to recommend to new listeners. Hello, hello, and if you don't mind, hello, my lovely friends, and welcome to another episode of ArloCast, a podcast. Arlo is a blue Muppet-like YouTuber who covers mostly Nintendo games, but also gaming news. That's also mostly Nintendo. I enjoy his content, and his podcast is no exception. He gets new guests every time. Okay, sure, there are some repeats, but even when that happens, 
he tries to change the lineup, so it at least is a different combination of people. It's also just a fun and friendly chat about things going on in newer gaming. There's also segments dedicated to food, and currently fake ad reads. That will hopefully become real ad reads one day. <laughs> and now on to the- that was everybody, right? Yeah, it was. Now on to the final segment of the show, What You Been Eatin'. You are a riot. You are a riot. But you know what? It's time for a word from our sponsor. This episode of Arlo Cast was brought to you by Panda Express. Okay, not, okay, well, okay, here's the thing. Not really, not sponsored by Panda Express, but I did uh, talk to a Panda Express representative. Uh, by that, I mean a, the... The girl at the counter. Arlo, uh, pies what, and Chinese food? Come on. Pies and Chinese food, no. Like all the good podcasts, it's laid back and chill. Sometimes it gets a little crazy, but only when it's deserved. And again, yeah, if you aren't into gaming podcasts, at least there's some dedicated segments to being something a little bit different. And hey, if you are really into gaming podcasts, but just hate how there's always just a solid screen image there, nothing moving. There's gameplay footage instead. So yeah, you can watch Mario Odyssey happen while you hear Arlo speak. I call that a win. Now again, there's only old episodes to go back to in both cases here. I don't know when either will update again, so just take that into consideration. I don't know when the next new episodes are, so just enjoy what's there for right now. So now for real, full YouTube videos. You know, if there's one thing Positive 2020 did for me personally, is that it actually gave me decent YouTube recommendations. Like, can we talk about this for just one second? Does anyone else have this problem where you watch one video from a channel, one you weren't even that super into, maybe you didn't even finish it, and YouTube just spams videos from just that channel? You never go back to it, but for weeks YouTube will think you really want to go back to that one channel, even though you never watched another one after that. And you know what? Okay, fine. It's helping you discover new stuff. I kind of get it. What I don't get is all the times I have unsubbed from a channel, and especially if it's a channel I haven't watched anything from for a while. And then, that's when YouTube starts recommending all the videos from that channel. I don't get it. I have told you explicitly I don't want to watch anything from this channel anymore. Why are you choosing this to be the time you pump the recommendations out? Especially since I don't even really use the recommendations. When I subscribe to a channel, I actually go to the subscriptions bar. Not everyone uses that, and that's fine. It makes sense to just use the recommendations page. But I click that so I can always get every single video from my subscriptions. So I want to use the recommendations tab to find stuff I didn't know to look for. And it doesn't help if you spam it with stuff from channels I have unsubbed from. But in 2020, things actually kind of turned around. I started seeing channels I'd never heard of, and videos that actually did sound kind of interesting. I won't lie, maybe it's because I had even more time to watch than usual. Uh, YouTube was pretty good at showing me stuff I didn't know I wanted to watch yet. So because of that, I actually have a couple specific videos and a couple specific channels. I'm gonna do channels I'd never heard of that were pretty much instant subscriptions for me. And then after that, I'm gonna do videos from people I'd already subscribed to that really just jumped out to me. And funny enough, that first half you could call the 2020 recommends and then the 2021 recommends. Before we do that, we're gonna do a perfect marriage of the two. A video that was so good, I subscribed instantly. And if this channel never uploaded ever again, I would still stay subscribed. I first really got into internet videos while I was graduating from high school. And that year was 2010. So yeah, the years I shifted into young adulthood also happened to be the rise of Blip TV and the original Channel Awesome website, all the way back when it was still called ThatGuyWithTheGlasses.com. 
I was there when people took the Nostalgia Critic seriously. And because I was a young adult, I had some semi-maturity, which means... When Doug Walker announced he was going to retire from the, from the Nostalgia Critic and focus on a demo reel, I was actually excited for the guy. I was happy that he didn't have to be stuck in something dead-end he didn't want to do anymore. That he'd get to move on. Create what he wanted to be his magnum opus. And considering my thoughts now on the company and the creator are so vastly different, yeah, it feels like another world even to me, saying it out loud. But I wanted Doug Walker to have his magnum opus. But you cannot make a magnum opus when you have absolutely no idea what you are doing. Years aren't kind to some forms of art. This is far from the only thing wrong with Doug Walker's past creations. And yet, Dumbo Reel is the thing that maybe was the biggest turning point. And yet, a lot of the videos covering the failures of Channel Awesome footnote Demo Reel at best. And then, I discovered this video by Lady Emily. Lady Emily so meticulously examined every single thing that went wrong here. Not just the script writing, not just the character writing, not just the lazy effects, not just the confused method of attempting to tell its seriousness and its comedy bits, how the script just does not work, how it can be up its own ass and just blatantly so, how the announcement was a mistake in timing, how the planning was a mistake in every way you'd want to plan out media, even how the backtracking had its elements of stupid. And it's funny, I've watched this video so many times, and every single time I see another demo reel clip in it and I'm surprised at what I'm watching. I was there when this was new and I don't remember this show as well as I thought I did. I see now why it is so footnoted. There is nothing there unless you really dedicate your time to it. Which is what the video does. Before watching it, I remember saying, finally someone's gonna actually sit down and talk about this show. And every time I'm done watching it, I go, Wow, there's no room for anyone else to talk about this show now. <laughs> Some legacies are best left like this. Demoreal was such an abject failure. This is the only way to really remember it. Everything that went wrong is too sad to even be a punchline. And it's still too terrible to be forgotten. It was this mix of missed ideas and broken egos. It's a warning if anything else. And the best way to suffer through it is through this really excellent video. By the by, slightly unrelated, uh, her dollar store game show video is pretty damn good too. Alright, so like I said, we're gonna go into channels I discovered during all of this. Uh, and since one of the years was 2020, uh, yeah, I discovered the guy Everybody discovered from 2020. Hey all, Scott here. Let's rank our cousins. Scott the Waz feels like a channel you could show to anybody and say, this is what internet shows are like. There's this perfect mix of learning from the past of other internet shows and also how to do your own thing. Sketch comedy is back now, a genre I thought was dead for this platform, and it's really excellent. The game reviews are very funny and are very in-depth. <laughs> and as someone who's been around here for a while, I have a soft spot when creators just have their friends on to play extras. And Scott, your friends are some of the best extras I've ever seen in this kind of content. I may have discovered Scott the Waz very recently, but he's in the pile of channels where I feel they only produce great content. It's the stuff I always enjoy watching, and I always enjoy every second of it. So while I do watch a lot of gaming reviews, I don't watch that many uh, game challenge videos. Now there is one big exception though, because after all, sometimes you just have to ask the eternal questions. There is a lot of magic in the Elder Scroll V game. Some spells are offensive, Others are defensive, some can spawn in new friends, and others still can bring old ones back from the dead. 
but there's one spell that's seemingly worthless. Can you beat Skyrim with only the telekinesis spell? There's just so many things I like about Mitten Squad. I like the variety of his challenges and the ideas that he has behind his challenges. I like how, even though they're comedy videos, if he breaks a rule, he is honest about it. He'll still keep making the video, but he'll make it clear, hey, I technically failed this challenge, by the by. Which, if you take this stuff very seriously, is probably refreshing that even the comedy one will adhere to the rules. The dark comedy never manages to go too far, at least not for me. And he feels very fast while also being very deadpan at the exact same time. Paul's stuff is just a clear example of not usually my thing, but we'll sit down every single time for your stuff. As discussed in the book section, I like the early Kingdom Hearts games. And speaking of the words, early Kingdom Hearts, to remind you once again, I'm an old timer when it comes to watching internet stuff, there used to be a bigger Kingdom Hearts community on YouTube. A lot of the old guard seems to kind of... I don't know if they're done with the game series necessarily, although I'm sure some of them are. The series is getting a bit more divisive, but that's another point to be perfectly honest. A lot of them I think are just moving on with their lives and trying to do new stuff. And they don't owe anybody an explanation, so I am just posturing. But of course, when an old guard moves on, a new guard tends to come to those greener pastures or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, we'll go with that, or whatever. And there's been a lot of new folks that I actually like quite a bit. Novion's content is pretty fun. I just started watching absolutely everything about. Her stuff's pretty good, too. But the one who really sticks out to me, his name is Regular Pat. The dude's not afraid to really dig into some ideas and be a bit silly. And he's just as not afraid to actually fully analyze the character writing for this whole franchise. The good thing about Pat is he loves every installment in this franchise, and it is a bit of a warts and all situation. He is willing to criticize something even if he does ultimately even like the decision. He's just willing to see what's not perfect about it. And I do find that pretty refreshing. I don't have to agree with every single thing a content creator is saying. I'd be a very boring person if I did. All I ask is that you explain your opinion to the best of your abilities. Explain it in a way where I understand why you feel that way. And I've never left a regular Pat video going, oh, I wish he just really explained a little bit more. I feel like I don't know what he was talking about. Doesn't matter if it's his boss rankings, it doesn't matter if it's Heartless Compendiums, or even just his kind of shitposty stuff. <laughs> I love everything from this channel. And yeah, it's one of those channels I watch everything from. <laughs> now, I've been saying Kingdom Hearts a lot, so you might be going, does he have non-Kingdom Hearts content? Because I'm not necessarily a Kingdom Hearts fan. And again, even if you're not a Kingdom Hearts fan, I think he keeps the discussions fun and entertaining enough. But obviously, because it is the main focus, I can understand you being a little bit leery. He has occasionally talked about other stuff, like Deltarune and Spyro Reignited. But, you know, YouTube algorithm. Don't expect those too much, because those don't seem to perform as well. But, at least there is some deviation, if you're interested. They're fun, they're witty, and they're surprisingly insightful. Yeah, regular Pat, pretty regular guy, with some pretty... very good content. I couldn't find a word that sounds like regular that meant really good. Let's just pretend I said excellent. Okay, so now just back to the singular videos. Wait, hold on, that's actually not entirely accurate. While there's only two more left, they're actually both individually a series of videos. The first one, in fact, is a series of live streams, and it's even the second season to a bunch of live streams. Today, I'm gonna be doing a randomized Nuzlocke of Pokemon Black with a twist. Every single Pokemon that I catch throughout this run will be represented and controlled by one of my friends. This is season two of the Pokemon Friendlock. So I discovered season one of the Friendlock through being already subscribed to Salty DK Dan. 
and I had a lot of fun watching those. So you probably know this is coming. I've been around the internet for a while. Because of that, I've been watching and reading a lot of Nuzlocke content. Or at least I was. Also, after doing the challenge myself a couple times, just for a personal, it was never a video series or anything, I kind of felt that the challenge itself was starting to get stale, as was the kind of content. Just the same kind of thing. It was no longer one of my specific interests. But after watching the Friendlock Season 1, I felt like a rekindling of what I originally liked about Nuzlocke content, and it kind of is some of the best Nuzlocke content to ever exist. It's just so much more full of fun and personality. So then, of course, going into Season 2, I was way more aware that this was a series of live streams that then gets edited into singular episodes. So there was basically a part in my personal life where every Sunday night I was tuning in to the Friendlock Season 2. At this point, this was when I was still working nights, so I didn't have to worry about missing sleep. So I booted up Halo Master Chief Collection, turned the sound off, went to get some collectibles, and watched the Friendlock Season 2. And I just fell in love with hearing this utterly bizarre cast of characters bounce off each other, piss each other off, attempt to tell some kind of story, and then get trampled over because how dare you try to tell a story? <laughs> we had Peter Ness and Sauerkraut, Jay and Tracy, Coach Kaz, Gerber Gaming, Kringle Fuck, Evil and Fucked Up Wizard. There's so many characters that I'm really sorry for anybody I didn't mention. There were so many of you, and I loved so many of you, all of you, that it's really hard to just list everybody. <laughs> You were all the perfect fucking oddballs for this stupid fucking adventure, and I wouldn't have had it any other way. You remember when Mikey D was getting revenge at the gym, and Hannah told everybody to give your energy to Mikey for the spirit bomb? I hit 30 in 2022, the big 3-0. Last year, when I was told to give Mikey D's my energy, I put my Xbox controller down, and I put my fucking hands in the air. I'm never going to be afraid of the fact that I did that. I will always be happy of the fact I was that thoroughly engaged with these silly ass live streams. <laughs> I know how the story ends because I've seen all the live streams, and I know the episodes aren't done being released yet. Guys, if you're waiting to see the episodes, you're in for a treat. <laughs> oh, and uh, pasty topa. So now for the last video series. And there's a bit of a difference in this. Other than the fact that these ones weren't live streams, these were entirely just edited episodes of a video essay series. Well, there's also a bigger difference. I really loved Salty's content through and through uh, when he was releasing these live streams. And this next guy. There's a sort of almost half redemption here. I didn't think his channel was bad. I liked quite a bit of his previous stuff, and then when I did like it, it was really thoroughly engaging, and I really liked what he was saying. There were some other times I wasn't as into it, though. Specifically, this guy would go on some tangents that I just didn't always felt fit, and oh no, the jokes just weren't always funny. <laughs> not even horribly unfunny, not why'd you tell that terrible joke, just I see where this is going, I just didn't find it really funny. And so this content creator, he kept promising this series of videos when he hit a certain subscriber mark. And I kept listening when he promised it, and I kept going, this will be probably great for you, and it'll be probably great for the people wanting it. It's not a subject matter I particularly care about, so I don't know. Then it came around. It's my favorite video of 2021. In five. Four, three, two. On September the 8th, 2007, after constant promotion and fanfare, the television show iCarly first premiered on Nickelodeon. I don't really care one way or the other about iCarly. I specifically am just neutral. But hearing Quentin reviews so thoroughly talk about everything about this series, just this shockingly amazing way that he does it. I've I've watched all three videos that are out twice. No stone is unturned here. He found a way to get to the Kids Choice Awards videos. 
He looked at the McDonald's toys. Oh, okay, guys. There's this bit in the Victorious episode where he tangents for a little bit to talk about all the video games. Uh, for a little bit, I mean it's a fucking hour. <laughs> And I'm so happy it was an hour. Every goddamn second of that bit is just... Oh, oh chef's kiss. It's beautiful. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how we could have made these videos any better. They are all just so good. And like I said, look, with no offense to the guy at all, because I was still enjoying the content like more than 50% of the time. If you'd asked me in 2020 what I thought of Quentin Reviews, I would have said, no, oh, I like the guy. He tangents a bit much, though. If you ask me what I think now, I, I, I love Quentin Reviews. That motherfucker knows how to tangent. Something I love about YouTube is how much people can just chat about things they love for every reason that they love it. And even every criticism they have that they see, they can't overlook, but it just doesn't ruin it for them. Or even if it kind of does, why? Fanning over something is just this interesting thing to watch people do. And it matters very little how you yourself feel about the property. I remember this one time when I was in college, this one guy I knew wanted to talk about Star Wars. And I may have accidentally uh, phrased something in a way that's on a way more meaner than I thought. I told the guy that I wasn't really a big Star Wars person, so I wouldn't have much to input. And I'm really afraid that the guy took it as, look man, I don't care about Star Wars, don't talk. I really didn't mean it that way. What I meant was, if you're looking for back and forth, you're not going to get it. But by all means, tell me everything about this thing you love. I don't know. It, it's one of the biggest reasons I still watch stuff on this platform. I love hearing people talk about what they love. And some people are incredibly gifted at it. So I may not go binge iCarly after this video series, because he didn't convince me to keep watching it, he just convinced me why so many people do binge iCarly, why they love iCarly. I completely love this video series. They're new favorites of mine. And I am uh, really waiting for Victorious Part 2 and all the shit that's gonna come after. <laughs> They hug, and I cry a little. Carly goes upstairs, where Freddy is taking the iCarly set down, and WHAT THE FUCK ARE YOU DOING, FREDDY? WHAT THE FUCK IS THAT?! YOU TOOK THE FUCKING LENS CAP OFF YOUR CAMERA! YOU DIDN'T PUT THE FUCKING CAP PROTECTOR ON IT! YOU DON'T DO THAT, MAN! YOU FUCKING SHUTTERS ALL OUT IN THE OPEN! YOU'RE GETTING FUCKING DUST IN YOUR GODDAMN CAMERA, MAN! YOU DIPSHIT! Well, here we are in the last chunk. TV shows. Which is actually the thing I did the least of. You know, back in high school, there was nothing I watched more than TV shows. And I still love TV, it's just... YouTube kind of took that over a few years ago, and... Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of why TV is last year. It's the thing I did the least of, and yet it's still... Got one of the biggest places in my heart. These first two shows have another thing in common, in that... There are shows I'd meant to get to for a very long time, and shows I was going to buy on DVD. And then when I finally did buy them on DVD, they both pretty immediately got Blu-ray releases. <laughs> this is not the first time this has happened to me. Uh, and I'm going to buy those Blu-ray releases, but for now, we'll just talk about the quality of the shows themselves. I don't want to answer any more of your questions. We're sorry to bother you at a time like this, Mrs. Twice. We would have come earlier, but your husband wasn't dead then. Police Squad lasted a whole six episodes, then got canned and turned into the Naked Gun movies. I like Zucker, Abrams, and Zucker a lot, but Naked Gun is honestly the stuff I remember the least. I'm just way more into Airplane and Top Secret. Hell, I feel like I remember both Hot Shots movies more than The Naked Gun. And now, I can say Police Squad is something I remember more than The Naked Gun. I know I've seen the first Naked Gun, and I can't tell you if I've seen the second. But I will definitely remember watching Police Squad. Police Squad fits this short-lived but very sweet category for me. The rapid-fire comedy hits just as hard as Z.I.Z. did at their best. In some ways, though, I'm also glad it was only six episodes. I feel like that still keeps it incredibly funny, and it especially prevents the premise from overstaying its welcome. 
especially now. It was a parody of the cop shows of the time, and those cop shows don't really exist anymore. They've kind of elevated to something different. Something I also feel is worth parodying, but the show would have to be quite different. It's a show I know I'll be able to rewatch the whole entire thing whenever I want. Just a really good afternoon. I'm Captain Frank Drebin. I understand you had a pretty rough time. Yeah, it was pretty bad. Cigarette? Yes, I know. And now next we have one of the DCAU shows I hadn't seen before. Now, the DCAU was the DC Comics Animated Universe, which started, sort of, with Batman the Animated Series, but only at the end after they did that redesign. And speaking of, that and Justice League were the ones I'd seen before. And I'll be real, I like Justice League a lot more. Batman the Animated Series was pretty great on its own, I just really like the storytelling of JL a lot better. And now that I've watched the Superman animated series, yeah, it's very clear that's where a lot of that better writing came from. Perfectly done. The AU just really gave us the perfect version of most of the DC characters. It, in levels that is surprising how often it happened. Supes is just so thoroughly lovable in both civilian and hero mode. The fighting is just as good as spending time with Ma and Pa Kent or Lois and Jimmy. This kind of it shows practically perfect from Perry White to Granny Goodness. So while those first two were shows I'd been meaning to watch for the first time for a while, this next show is sort of actually an oddity in the whole watch versus rewatch idea in general. Because I grew up with this show, but how many episodes of the show did I actually watch? In fact, the main rewatch, you could argue, happened a few years ago. I was late to Dragon Ball Z when I was a kid. I started my adventure with Boo. <laughs> so while I got the occasional rerun, I missed most of the Frieza arc. I missed pretty sure even more of the Cell slash Android arc. I don't think I saw a single episode of the Saiyan arc. Now, I'll be real, I liked Majin Buu quite a bit as a kid, and I can't wait to go back to that in all honesty. I hear it's rough, but that's where my nostalgia is the highest. I will probably let some stuff slide. But the thing is, because that's when I started watching, I don't know if this is true for every state around that time over here in the United States, but once Boo was kind of over with, just before GT started airing, that was when they finally started airing the dub for original Dragon Ball. And that's what I did a rewatch of a few years ago. And look, I liked original Dragon Ball more than Z even as a kid. And considering how little I'd seen of Z, that shouldn't necessarily be too surprising, even though there are plenty of people who also like original Dragon Ball more today. And rewatching original Dragon Ball a few years ago, it was shocking how much I basically loved it just as much. But we're not here to talk about that. Although, on the realm of what we can and cannot talk about, I should admit that in 2020, I finally finished watching Dragon Ball Super. So is it worth talking about Dragon Ball Super? For the purposes of the timeline of this video, unfortunately not. Because most of Super I'd seen before 2020, catching it on Verve, and then sometimes the Funimation subscription when I felt like getting one of those, mostly I didn't watch in 2020, even if I finished it in 2020. I can tell you that I like Dragon Ball Super. I have fun with the slice of life kind of style that it's going for. And since I saw all of the Tournament of Power in 2020, Tournament of Power is really, really good, so I can at least tell you that. But now we skip to 2021, where I did start my Z rewatch. Or first time watch, really, for the most of it. I didn't get the boo yet. So here's my thoughts on all the stuff before. The Saiyan Saga is really good for my first time watching it. <laughs> I'm watching the older dub right now. The fighting is still really good, though. 
How the hell do so many fans jump into this without the context, though? I'm sorry, I don't want to spend too much time on original Dragon Ball, but... The gut punch of Raditz, how does that work when you have no context? You're supposed to have watched 100 plus episodes, or read 100 plus chapters before you find out about him. That is how that's supposed to work. It's supposed to be gut-wrenching, and how does that work if you don't even know what a Goku is? You're supposed to go, this plucky kid I watched grow up was supposed to be evil incarnate? Was an evil alien bent on destroying the world? That's what he was supposed to really be? All of what I've seen was him not knowing he was lying to himself. It's supposed to be a personal betrayal in some ways. And you'll know none of that if you just watch Z first. How do you guys do it? I don't get it. And it also really puts that power behind Goku continuing to reject the Saiyan heritage anyway. It feels so rewarding. And then there's Piccolo's Redemption, a character that again, you would not even know the backstory to if you skipped Dragon Ball. The, the team up that eventually defeats Vegeta. Hell, you know what? You know what I loved? That episode of that robot that's stuck in the cave that befriends Gohan. That felt entirely like a made-for-the-anime episode, but I won't lie, that is where I started to go, oh, this is good. Something about the way that that helped mature Gohan, the way, what it was trying to do with that, that was so good. That's an episode no one talks about, and that's sad. That, that really helped me just right get into this. I loved the Saiyan Saga. <laughs> And I feel I love it so much because I know original Dragon Ball. And if that wasn't enough, then we get to the Namek stuff and the Frieza stuff. Frieza stuff is better than the Saiyan Saga, which was already really good. Vegeta on the hero side, while refusing the typical redemption this series has made a staple out of already. Piccolo was not the first character to get redemption. Hell, Tien wasn't the first character to get redemption. Oolong was where this series started doing redemption. That is how much of a tradition that is. And here's Vegeta being the first guy rejecting it. That is... It's so fresh even now, watching it for roughly the first time. The utter malice of Frieza. The reveal of Piccolo and Kami's people. Goku's ascensions, not just the Super Saiyan stuff, but the training he does on the ship. There is so much I loved about this. The pacing issues were there, the early dubisms were there. The Frieza Saga was still so refreshingly good, and it holds up remarkably well. I'm even gonna say it y'all are too rough on uh, Linda. <laughs> There's something about Raspy Frieza that I also really like. It's time to make my wish. Lord Frieza, allow me to honor you by performing the Dance of Joy. Uh, Ginyu, if you value your life, stop. Oh, yes, Lord. <sighs> but now we have the Android Saga. I wanted this video to just be positive experiences. But we have the Android Saga. I'm sorry. I get a lot of people who grew up with the Android Saga as it was going on. That they connected with Gohan, and that still carries with them. They recognize the flaws of that saga, but they easily look past it because they're attached to Gohan. And that's kind of why I said I can't wait to get back to the Majin Buu stuff. It'll be my turn when we get to Boo. I do really like the driving filler. That, that, that was a really fun episode. Cell's designs are great. Even the really derpy one. But I really do love that first form one. The creepy ass bug man. That, that's good. Not that perfect form isn't perfect. There's also this one moment that, once again, I'm pretty sure is anime exclusive. It's between Goku and Gohan, where Gohan finally achieves Super Saiyan in the uh, hyperbolic time chamber. I love that scene, that's remarkably good. 
Everything else though was so poorly paced. The villain change up happens so often, I just never really felt like I got where it was going. Okay, in 17 and 18, I don't understand their good version personalities yet. Would someone please kindly explain to me what is so different about them in this timeline? Because I didn't feel it. I understand their personalities in the evil timeline. I felt like I spent enough time with that version of them, even though it was comparatively less. But nothing was telling me that this 17 and 18 are actually different, just because they had to make room for Cell. They're pushed to the sidelines so quickly that I don't understand the redemption here. I'm sure I will eventually. I remember 18 being a bigger character in Boo, so I'm sure some of that's there. And again, I've watched all of Super. I know what 17 turns out to be later. I get that it will be fixed. I'm saying I don't feel like it was in the Android Saga. And can we talk about the power scaling? I heard people say Frieza was where the power scaling got really screwed up. I think it got really screwed up here. Frieza being the most powerful being in the galaxy, I think that's just anime tropey enough that it works. But the, but the fucking hacky sacking of who's the strongest character in the Android Saga. Sometimes it was Vegeta, sometimes it was Trunks, oh now it's Cell, oh fuck you, no now it's not, now it's Android 16. I... In some ways, I hated it. <laughs> I hated how messy it was, but at least I'm more excited for Boo. Because if the Android Saga is the one where nostalgia clouds uh, the messy writing for a lot of people, then hey, <laughs> I also hear Boo's the messy one, but those people aren't as nostalgic for Boo. So I probably won't mind it, <laughs> you know? But now you probably have this question. If you're excited for Boo, why haven't you started watching Boo? Well, uh, did you know that Funimation occasionally has this sale on their site for all of the Z movies, with the exception of Bardock slash The History of Trunks, so I still need to buy that. But it also includes the Super Broly movie, so whatever, at least you, there's a nice trade-off. <laughs> I told myself I would buy that next time the sale was up, and uh, 2021 Christmas time rolls around, sale comes up, Merry Christmas to me! And the funny thing is too, when I rewatched original Dragon Ball, I also got to the movies, and no joke, I watched those during December. <laughs> this is a weird Christmas tradition for me now. I watch Dragon Ball movies. <laughs> what a life, huh? And now it's time for my top 6 Dragon Ball Z movies. And also including Super, but not Bardock or History of Trunks. Uh. Number 6, The Dead Zone. Somehow the first one stayed one of the best ones, even if that trippy scene is weird and goes on for too long. I'm actually madder now that the Garlic Jr. Fella saga fucking sucks because the movie's really good. <laughs> Number 5, Cooler's Revenge. Oh fuck, it's Frieza's brother, but he's got this really cool sleek design and a really cool moveset, and his personality's actually pretty decent for a movie villain. How does a generic idea end up this good? Number 4. You're gonna hate me for this, but it's Super Android 13. Yeah, because I didn't like the Android saga that much. Seeing a dumb, fun action version of that, I was all over it. And the dub exclusive jokes are actually really funny, don't you dare tell me they aren't. Number 3. Fusion Reborn. Janemba Janemba. 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 Number 2. Super Broly. If this list had gone on to 7, that's where original Broly would have been. But Super Broly really captures a lot of what the franchise was as a whole. And it's also just really good. <laughs> it manages to be a really fun time, and even fixes some of the problems that the first Broly movie had. And especially those sequels. Those are almost unwatchable. Like, I, I, like actually, actually, yeah, 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 no. Uh, Bio Broly's bad, but like, Second Coming is horrible. I, I, that's worse than the live action movie, I'm not joking. Number 1. Battle of Gods. Everything I said about Super Broly, except this is even better than that. This is a really enjoyable and fun film. You could almost recommend to non-fans, except no you can't, because you kinda had to know who all these people are already to understand why it's really fun to see them interact. Now of course, that was just my personal top 6, uh, technically 7, and it's personal opinion you know. so you just have to remember one thing. None of these were as good as Path to Power. So now that that's over, 
yeah, I promised we'd be back to TV show movies. And you may have thought that was the only ones. We got one more collection to go through. There was something I wanted to do in 2020. Because of something I'd watched a few years prior, I was compelled to track down and rewatch the entire back catalog of a certain franchise's movies, and even their TV specials. <laughs> and it's another anime series. <laughs> Get ready for this. Anime movies based on shows are a weird thing, you know? They really only work for people who are fans already, as I kind of mentioned with Battle of Gods. But because of that, that means even when they're not the greatest, they can hit you emotionally harder than almost anything else. And because I had to rewatch one, I went through the rest. <laughs> the ones I hadn't seen since I was a kid, and the ones I just hadn't seen in general. <laughs> Do you guys know about Mastermind of Mirage Pokemon? It's this one that has a little bit of infamy online because it was the first time they had a new dub. And that's a shame because it was supposed to be this nice big anniversary special and it is pretty fun. It's got a cool villain, got a nice original plot. No one thinks about this one anymore. Try to watch it if you can. It's a special feature on the collector's edition of the Lucario movie. Destiny Deoxys was just as great as I remembered it. And so was Jirachi Wishmaker. Why is the Lucario one the only Hoenn movie people remember? The Hoenn movies were so good. And Kirim and the Sword of Justice. For the only good Best Wishes movie, they did a really good job with that one. But the power of us, man. That one actually feels like an actual real movie. I could almost recommend it to real people, but mm, this is Pokemon fans only, sorry. You know, people seem to love that Darkrai movie. I liked it, but honestly, Arceus and the Jewel of Life all the way for me. You are all sleeping on Pokemon Ranger and the Temple of the Sea. I know I wrote that one off as a teenager, but that one slaps. That's really considered one of the boring ones. Did you actually watch it? Did you go to the bathroom instead? I know opinions are opinions, you're all allowed to have one, but really? And I think none of these are the ones that I said justified the marathon. I am gonna get bullied for this. Pokemon I Choose You feels like the Pokemon anime I always wanted, but never knew I wanted. My emotional attachment to Ash Ketchum and Pikachu finally feels like it's paid off after decades. That they finally gave me the version of the story I always deserved to see. The gunk from the first season is gone. Only this really fantastic little story that shows me I was right to always love it. The new characters are great. The, the story, when it is different from the first season, is still just as engaging. And yes, this is the one that gets memed really hard because Pikachu talks for a whole sentence. Again, opinions. Some people are going to watch it with context and still think it's not that good. I get it. But it works for me. It's on rewatch. This isn't just the Pokemon movie I like the best. It's one of my favorite movies and... We all deserve to love something that just works for you. No matter how silly it may sound, even to you. What we share from the start Feels like one beating heart I choose you I choose you Thanks for watching. <laughs>